And finally, blood pressure. What is it that influences blood pressure and why does it matter? Blood pressure is influenced primarily by two things. The cardiac output, you can see in the first video, that's where we talked about cardiac output in this chapter. And then also the total peripheral resistance that exists all throughout the blood vessels of the body. Increasing any of these things, so cardiac rate, um, heart rate, stroke volume, how much blood is leaving the heart per beat, and um, total peripheral resistance. If we increase any of those things, that's going to lead to an increase in the blood pressure in the arteries. When would the resistance increase? Well, think back to the autonomic nervous system, right? This is, um, this is something that can be influenced by the activity of the autonomic nervous system. That nervous system can cause blood vessels to contract or to relax. So, right, changing the, the constriction, that's going to end up modifying the blood pressure in return. So anytime, if you have fluid flowing through a pipe, um, like a blood vessel, anytime there is a constriction, what's that going to do? It's going to increase the pressure it, very much. Um, think of a hose, if you've ever, I'm sure you've played with a hose. If you haven't played with a hose, you've got to do that. Go outside, turn on the hose. If you put your thumb over the end, uh, what happens? The water starts spraying out more quickly. Okay, so making that constriction at the end where you put your, hose on, your thumb on the end of the hose, um, that constriction increases the pressure and the water flows out more quickly as a result. Same thing with blood vessels. Let's take a look here. Um, I'd like to have you think in terms of arteries and veins. So remember, blood leaves the heart, travels through an artery, makes its way to a capillary bed, uh, which then merges back into a vein. Okay, so what is that capillary bed? Let's take a look. A capillary bed, um, capillaries are very small. And so essentially what we have, as blood flows through this artery, branches out into the capillaries here, each capillary is acting as a constriction. So this is a site that, um, well, we already know that it's extremely important for allowing exchange of substances, but it has another consequence. The fact that capillaries are small and that they are constrictions, this ends up leading to an increase in pressure in the artery side and a decrease in pressure in the vein side. So this just kind of goes back to helping to explain why is it that arteries are pressurized, veins are not. It's in part due to the presence of the capillaries. So this does a nice, this graph does a nice job of just mapping out the pressure drop and then um, the cross-sectional area. So the capillaries, they're very small, but there are a lot of them. So in total, there is a high cross-sectional area at that point. Blood pressure is something that it's very important to maintain. So our bodies have ways of detecting blood pressure. It's through the use of receptors. They're called baroreceptors. Baroreceptors are just another type of stretch receptor. They're located inside of the aortic arch and also inside of the carotid sinuses. And um, they are receptors that are always sending an action potential. So action potential. So they have sort of like a baseline frequency. And um, if the blood pressure increases, what that does is it increases the stretch on this receptor and causes it to fire more frequently, causes more frequent action potentials to be sent up to the nervous system. So that can end up leading to vasoconstriction or vasodilation, depending on which, which way are the action potentials happening more closely together or are they spread further apart. A decrease in blood pressure would lead to a decrease in the frequency of action potentials. And so that would be something that could trigger the blood vessels to constrict as a result in order to bring blood pressure back up to normal. So let's take a look at um, another, another negative feedback loop. And this is called the baroreceptor reflex. So what we're going to consider is a person who's been lying down and then all of a sudden they get up. When, uh, when you do that, when a person does that, as you stand up, what happens? Gravity is going to be pulling blood down towards the legs. And so this would end up leading to a drop in blood pressure, which could be very bad. We need to keep the pressure at a certain level in order to keep circulation, for example, up to the brain happening. Um, so let's walk through this. Okay, so we go from lying down to standing up, upright. What this is going to do is decrease the venous return. So more of the blood is pooled in the legs, and so not quite as much is gonna be traveling back into the heart at that point. 
that's going to decrease the EDV and diastolic volume, which we know about that, that's going to cause a decrease in stroke volume. So the heart is not pumping out quite as much blood anymore per beat. That in turn decreases the cardiac output which in turn decreases the blood pressure. And so even in the arteries, there's not gonna be as much blood pressure now. That will modify the signals being sent by the baroreceptors. So that's gonna send a signal up to the nervous system. That signal will be received and processed by the medulla, which will do a couple of key things. And so it's going to um, cause vasoconstriction of the arteries. So making a constriction in the arteries, I don't know if you can hear that sneeze. Um, constriction in the arteries, this is going to increase the, um, the resistance and that in turn will help to increase the blood pressure. The other thing that's going on is an increase in heart rate. The medulla will cause the heart rate to increase and so that helps to increase the cardiac output and that also feeds into modifying the blood pressure. So there's a, there's a feedback loop, hopefully this one is feels like things are kind of coming together. We've covered a lot of ground in physiology together at this point. Uh, we've learned a lot of different key systems in the body and they do all have to work together. So we should be at the point where we're starting to see these interconnections and they should hopefully be more or less making sense. Even if you don't understand all the details, you can at least follow through um, a, a sort of a flow chart like this and understand what's going on. So blood pressure is something that we can measure. Blood pressure is measured with a sphygmomanometer. You've got to try saying that. If you don't know how to say it, sphygmomanometer. Sphygmomanometers, these are the things that we can use to measure blood pressure. And uh, it uses a blood pressure cuff. These are pretty much automatic these days. It used to be that you'd use a cuff and you'd have to listen with a stethoscope, listen to the blood flow. Um, it, we, it's pretty much automatic these days with automatic blood pressure cuffs. Anyway, um, an average blood pressure reading is 120 over 80. These two numbers are giving us a reading of the pressure in an artery at two different stages of the cardiac cycle. 120, this is called the systolic pressure. This is the pressure during systole, so during the contraction phase. Um, contraction is when the blood pressure is going to be highest. Okay, so in the arteries, um, that's like the maximum pressure during the cardiac cycle. And then 80, this is the resting pressure, the, the diastolic pressure. This is when the heart is resting, and so the blood pressure is gonna be at a minimum. So those two readings, both are very important for sort of monitoring overall blood pressure, which leads us into hyper, uh, discussion of hypertension. So hypertension is the name for high blood pressure, and it tends to be more common um, as people get older, they're more prone to, to have hypertension. There are a few different reasons for that, um, but it's a problem because it increases risk for a number of other things, it increases risk for heart disease, um, kidney disease, and also stroke. Those, so those are all very serious conditions to have. What is it that's classified as high blood pressure? So there's a range of normal values for blood pressure. High blood pressure is generally taken as um, a systolic pressure greater than 140 or a diastolic pressure that's greater than 90. And that would need to be not just like a one-time reading, but consistently the blood pressure seems to be higher than those values. So that's something that um, would, would, be, would be concerning, something that should be um, treated in some way, either with lifestyle changes or with drugs to help manage hypertension. And uh, again, just what does this end up causing? This can cause vascular damage. So if the blood vessels are always under high pressure, um, this can lead to damage of the blood vessels over time. This can also lead to changes within the heart. So if the, if the blood pressure is high, that means there's a high peripheral resistance. It's gonna be hard for the heart to pump blood out into circulation. So the heart is going to have to work harder. Remember the heart is, it's a muscle. So if it has to work harder, then it is going to grow larger over time. So enlargement of the heart is something that can happen as a result of high blood pressure over time. That's called hypertrophy. If a tissue grows larger than it, than it used to be, um, this can lead to arrhythmias, irregular electrical signaling going on in the heart and ultimately a heart attack can result from that. So very serious. Um, and then finally, hypertension can also contribute to development of 
hardening of the arteries, atherosclerosis. So this is something um, to get checked out for. You, sh you should periodically, even now, whatever age you are now, you should occasionally be um, aware of what your blood pressure is, either just when you go in for a normal checkup, just kind of pay attention, what is my blood pressure? And if you know that you have high blood pressure in your family, running in your family especially, um, this is something that you really want to pay attention to. It's something that oftentimes can be effectively managed with lifestyle changes, diet and exercise, um, but it's also something that there are pharmaceuticals available to help if lifestyle modifications don't do the trick.